first main episode in a while. Yeah. Welcome back to Gaudi. We're we're back, only slightly older and greyer, uh, midway through our Gaudi series, and we've got some more buildings to talk about. The good ones. It was quite a long time ago that we recorded the last main episode, but we were talking we were talking then about what I think are still regarded as like slightly early works or slightly not quite full Gaudi kind of works. Um, they're not they're not mega on the tourist trail, and that's not just because lots of them are not in Barcelona. And in fact, the first one we're going to talk about, I would say, is still before. Yeah, it's still a main deep style. Cut. But by yeah. the end of the episode, we're going to wade right into the touristy. I think I think there will be I think there will be coaster. like roughly three episodes of um of the big of the famous stuff. Yeah, this is part of it. This um, is part one of that. You're listening to about buildings and cities. Is the name of this podcast. Yes, I'm, I'm George Kinjal. I'm Luke Jones. And we're going to cover three of Gaudi's projects deep in the grid, deep in the grid of the exemple new city. There are three projects all out in the new city blocks that had been laid out as part of the kind of uh, Barcelona expansion plan. In fact, two of them are on Passage de Gracia, which is a sort of pre-existing monumental route but one which was then incorporated into the um, urbanistic plan that was that was adopted these are urban and domestic they're apartment buildings and houses and the thing that makes them urban which i'm sure we've said lots of times is when you've got buildings all around you yes and so the site is constrained tight and tall there are no villas in this really there's a townhouse and blocks of flats yeah and more than any other projects so far they're also about putting up a facade that people are going to actually look at. So although the Palau Guel is technically an urban palace, it's in the extremely sort of constrained street where you kind of are right up against the facade before you can really get a good look at it. And unlike that, the projects that we're going to talk about today are all on pretty well sized thoroughfares. thoroughfares where you can get a good old look at them as long as there aren't, there isn't a bus or some trees, trees, a tram that kind of thing in the way yeah and they're landmarks right should we start talking about them yeah sure i think the other things about what makes these particular will become apparent that's a calvet this one was built between 1898 and 1900 so this is about a decade after most of the projects we were talking about in the last episode we've reached the 20th century we've reached the 20th century yes there's an overlap between these things yeah it's interesting because this one we'll talk about two later that are definitely modern yeah as in they don't they uh, where they make historic allusion is very abstract or kind of distant like the, the that is definitely not driving the project whereas this one it's not really a historicist building but it has conspicuous and overt historicist elements yeah and it's a kind of um well i'd say it's a sort of historical synthesis a bit like some of the interiors of the palau well i would say you know? yeah eclectic yeah it's historical yeah and eclectic it doesn't historical. have historical massing but it is a historicist dressing in a loose eclectic way of a building he gets the job because this is another textile manufacturer so it's someone in the same social circle says um you say big well it's a bit of it, like uh the project in leon it's got commercial premises and it's also got it's got like a mixture of different things going on. It's got that it's got residence for them and it's also got flats and it's got kind of various different things happening. I think we could talk about the facade. I'd say there's like three things with this project. Yeah. The street facade, which would be the obvious first thing, um, the interior and the back. And they all feel like they could be in different buildings. Yeah. Um this is a building which is not totally sure at all points what it is. So the street front, which I think is almost the easiest. It is a bit taller than it's wide. It is five bays of windows. Uh, on the ground floor, it looks like retail, at least yeah. a bit. Um, and it's five bays tall with normal windows. And there's a sort of Attica story. Yeah. Um, the facade is of big rusticated stone blocks. It's got a, a sort of flouncy Baroque roof line with sculptures. Yeah, with these sort of like Dutch gables or, yeah, or yeah these kind of rounded uh, which ginger, is gingerbread vibe. Very expressive, but also yeah. feels very much like a flat thing that's been kind of cut out, like, like with a jigsaw. It's got 
rounded, protruding little balconies, yeah. like sort of big Juliet balconies, which also kind of add to the expression in dark ironwork. If you told me it wasn't my Gaudi, I wouldn't be surprised. It feels like this feels like a like very loose um quite luscious not terribly like historically accurate historicist facade yeah we talked i mean we talked about lewis dominic's um sam po hospital uh on the bonus and this like of all the gaudi projects we've looked at feels sort of most close to that doesn't it it's yeah like a very this is jolly more jokey i yeah. think like his ones are i don't know they're pretty jokey they're like little yellow domes and things they're 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 jocund and fun yeah sure. but this one but i still i still think they take themselves fairly seriously like yeah. they're quite ac academically correct whereas this is not at all academically correct yeah. this feels a this feels um with a sensibility which isn't like that but it goes a bit more towards the naive sure yeah no, i could get i could buy that and then what else is there there's like a big bay window above the front door i think there are various little elements on the facade which play on the identity of the client there are like little bobbins and things there's sort of little symbolic elements which are like slightly m medievalist intention to, to to kind of like symbolize symbolize the client and kind of like romanticize a little bit but also in a funny way them and yeah where their money it reminds comes me from. of a bit like um the natural history museum in oxford with ruskin yeah you know trying to have this carving which is in a spirit a medieval spirit but it's kind of uh, and trying to be jocular yeah jokey like this medieval carvings can be you know little people crawling out of the things but it, within a kind of like this is still made to a plan yeah like the building isn't like that it's 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 kind of like quite measured it's collagey it's also it's kind of additive you know the balconies are on little brackets in like later projects we're going to see like balconies which are kind of like undulating and growing out of the wall or whatever it's very much not that it's very much playing the game of arranging elements even if it's not sort of academic in its sort of deference to the rules it's sort of academic in the sense that it's playing a, a compositional game rather yeah. than a kind of organic or sort of sculptural i think we were game. discussing before about um how later on in his in gaudi's career he kind of breaks free of um, notions of like how different building elements function mm. or that a building is kind of composed like syntactically out of yeah. like known elements you have a facade you kind of put out according to kind of principles windows and doors on it this feels like it's like that it's like the yeah. windows and doors are... now the proportions are sort of strange and the, like the way that the the brackets function with the window it's kind of kind of off too muscular or a combination of naive and detailed but it's still articulated elements. Yeah. Um, quite nice facade, I think. Yeah, it's sweet. It's sweet. Uh, I no complaints. Um, we can look at the plan. So the plan is quite uh, kind of orthogonal and conventional. Uh, it's got a stair. If you imagine it's a kind of like, um, it's a rectangle in the site, as they frequently are. Um, it's got a square stair square spiral stair in the middle of the plan with a light well on either side of it and then it's got rooms across the front rooms across the back and kind of like rooms wrapping around the side with also i think there's two little other tiny light wells there which are um are kind of admitting light into into some of those side rooms what can you really say about it it's it seems quite pragmatic unusually yeah it looks fine it looks nice it looks very much like it's got a bit more circulation space than you'd be aiming to have there's an awful lot around the core around these two light wells yeah i think that this like turn of the century though is very much the era of like delightful circulation delightful yeah. superfluous circulation it's which is uh, and i'm not sure all know. of the plans are like i think this is the sort of entertaining flaws yeah the other, um, I'm, yeah, fr from front to back, there's all, there's a kind of there's a really simple inversion, which is that the balconies on both sides, on the front, the balconies are in bays two and four, mm. and in the on the back balcony they're in one, three, and five. So there's just sort of a yeah. very simple like uh, but shuffle. In, and two and four have big bay windows instead, yeah. which actually yeah. are are much more the big, the kind of biggest entertaining rooms are actually on the back. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, oh yeah, section. Um, so yeah, let's talk about the back because the back is a lot wilder and cooler, I think, than the front. It's still kind of baroque, or it has kind of it's more baroque than anything else. So mm -hmm. it's got you know that thing of the sort of the kind of classical balustrade along the top with little um, kind of statuesque 
finial thing sticking up from it. It's got lots of, actually, lots of kind of balustrading of a distinctly kind of classical type. Uh, some of it wiggling out from the facade and then going back in again. The colour scheme, not so much, though. But it does feel kind of... In this. It also feels like proto-modern, industrial. Mm. Uh, when we're talking about the back of the Guel Palace, it's got that strange bay window, yeah, which is more elaborate and strange than this yeah but is but but does make gestures towards being kind of mechanical yeah and this feels a bit mechanical yeah it has this like tealy copper green gridded windows and shutters yeah the bays go up they feel almost like as if they're reaching towards deco or something or yeah or yeah or, very very like there's a there's a there's a, a hint of the cockpit about them isn't there yeah or the prow um there's also something distinctively modern feeling about this horizontal banding that it's got so the the although they are bay windows they're they they're kind of wraparound windows that go all the way around the bay and it, it as a consequence the sort of band where the bays and where you go out onto the balcony they sort of feel like voids and then the um the balustrading and the the gap between the between the bay window fenestration and the stories feel like sort of punched forward Partly because it's white as well. Yeah, it's all uh, the, yeah, the white, the it, white painting and yeah. the kind of really industrial blur, flat colour. Yeah, it's got like a bit of a, a um, hint of the modern. And I think it's not super duper duper early to be looking that modern. If you were thinking of it in terms of what was going on in Vienna or Barons is getting going at this time, I guess. Yeah, but for Gaudi, it is. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> the Gaudi is a bit of a road untaken. I mean, it feels like this is definitely him responding to people like Hoffman and um, Wagner and those kind of. Yeah, I mean, people. I was I was really thinking of Hoffman. Yeah, yeah, for someone whose kind of uh, mythos is so sort of um, like unworldly, uh, actually, I think he got through an enormous amount of uh, magazines and. Uh, he was know. definitely into architecture, right? Yeah. And he knew what, you yeah, if you were? He, yeah, he knew what was cool. <laughs> this whole building doesn't feel like he's really cut into his style yet, which is why I think it's interesting that um, it's kind of going on after the Guell yeah. wine house, yeah. which isn't his own style. I, I think that's also, we'll, we'll talk about it um, probably in the next episode, I guess. Isn't his own style, it, I can feel it like taking also from stuff from books, but it feels a bit more like it than this. Yeah. And it's got super, the circulation spaces are super duper lush and yeah. in Historicist Nouveau with lots of beautiful tiles and um, fancy terrazzo um, polished details and beautiful what? curvaceous ironmongery. What's the name of that kind of column? The, the columns that you have in Solom the belt? Solomonic? Solomonic, oh. yeah. The wiggly ones, yeah. Yeah, like Solomon's Temple. Yeah, the wiggly ones like in the Baldacchino in St. Peter's. Well, so in this case, they're, um, they're holding up the staircase and they're made of terrazzo. Um, that must have been fun to make. Yeah. Gosh, yes. A lot of people <laughs> got silicosis grinding those down, I imagine. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, but they're, maybe they're worth it. Who's to say? Um, the light wells feel quite al andalusi you've got this lovely kind of dark blue tile work you've got a real sense of like cool it's absolutely cool. full yeah. of um this is full of like expensive well-made crafty stuff yeah it's a real like gothic baroque fusion so you've got like the baroque columns but then actually as soon as you get to the the stair is supported by this kind of vaulting which is like extremely sort of um you know, Lady Chapel kind of vibes, and it's uh, got it's got a certain amount of um, being through the um, being through the nineteenth century uh, Gothic painting style. Yeah, but quite well done, I think. Quite quite nicely and freely handled. Yeah, everything is just detailed within an inch of its life. But there is not a square centimeter that has not it's definitely had some serious craft done to it. Yeah, but even, this uh, one even isn't like a total break the bank project in comparison to <laughs> the other ones. Yes, this feels like him on his on his reasonable behaviour. I really enjoy. I like. I do. Yeah. I really enjoy his historic eclecticism because I think he does bring a real sort of freedom and, like you say, a kind of jokiness to it, which is very enjoyable. And there's always there's always so much to look at. I think they're lovely buildings, but I don't think the strength of this sort of thing would make him into like um, the world's favourite architect. The world's favourite architect. No, indeed. <laughs> I don't want to seem dismissive of things that I think are very nice and very good. And, and nice may not be the right word, but we're going to see with Gaudi some buildings that I think um, 
like deserve their place in the nuclear bunker with you know the world's greatest artworks and, yeah um yeah which, this probably wouldn't make the cut no whereas these other ones we might be cutting out with the space based laser and taking with us to yeah. the next planet casa bio this is a private residence built for mr josep bio e casanovas a textile industrialist this yeah. one is very very fruity this one's very fruity so the, you know they're kind of the familiar type textile industrialists also owned a big newspaper which is the sort of uh, respectable center barcelona paper apparently they are called la vanguardia yeah, yeah, yeah. the cent centrist means like um liberal which means pro-industrialist yeah. So, what can you say about this? It, this was uh, built between 1904 and 1906. It's on this, it's got this, like, amazing position. It's on Passage de Gracia, which, uh, yeah, we mentioned. It's, like, um, one of the biggest, one of the most monumental streets in the plan. And it's, a, yeah, it's, like, a pre-existing... Um, Prestige place to, yeah. you know, the Grand Canal in Venice, you know, all of those big villas on it. Yeah, it's yeah. like that, but for Barcelona, it's got yeah. lots of... And this yeah. particular corner has got a whole succession of yeah. late it's, 19th, early 20th century, eclectic, yeah. funky, it's got this mega um, this, townhouses. Yeah, this amazing of parade of five, uh, of five totally, totally out there, late 19th, early 20th century buildings. There is Casa Amatler by Josep Puig, Casa Leo Morera by Luis Domenech. It's the one far left... That makes sense. Saucy sort of Venetian Gothic number. Yeah. Casa Muleras by Enrique Saunier and Casa Josefina Bonnet. And I think Saunier's one is the one... And then Gaudi's is number five, if you're kind of going up. He's he's the last one in the series. So the one next to the Gaudi's is Casa Amatler by uh, Joseph Puig. Yeah, which is, as you say... What is it? It's kind of like... Venetian Gothic, but with a very but with, roof. But but with a Dutch roof. Yeah. Uh, and Love quite it. arts and crafty. A, a thing that you get in some arts and crafts building is this like band of windows. Yeah. That's like really going towards the strip window, but is made of lots of little subdivisions. Yeah. Um, which gives you, which could could be at one level like a, a walking long gallery, or um, could be a kind of going towards the modern arts and crafts interior, which is always kind of nice and cool and then it's got that gable which has yeah. got a great street presence and this is a building i know nothing about and i'm working on yeah having walked past it a few times the street is called is like by repute called the street of discord um but i think that that's not really true actually it's quite a kind of harmonious enjoyable sort of assortment um uh, and not without like a few little kind of gestures of mutual recognition between the different buildings um gaudi's building sort of steps down on the left side to come close to the the level of the the house that it's next to and the others all kind of often sort of line through with their uh uh their kind of roof lines and things like yeah. that yeah what it is is that it's got a succession of buildings on it that are loud they're loud they're eclectic so the one next so the um uh a is uh for a chocolate magnet that's oh, nice! That's yeah, much that's better. The, that's the neighbours. <laughs> that's good. Uh, I mean, you, you would always be you'd always be friendly with yeah. them. But anyway, you can imagine um, how Gaudi met the client for this one, and apparently, he had to pray to the Virgin of Montserrat. He he's undertaken he was only going to do religious commissions from now on at some point uh, around here, but he, and he had to pray to the Virgin of Montserrat to. Well, see he did do he was a few non-religious to... <laughs> commissions. <laughs> yes, so well, she um, said yes. She said yes. He uh, had to ask was, permission. She <laughs> was very. She's been very accommodating. Yeah, she had to ask permission. So, am I right in saying this one had some pre-existing building in it? it? There was a pre-existing building on the site, and parts of the structure of the existing building are incorporated in some way. It's not very evident. What they are. What they are. But um, but yes, this is technically a refurb. Uh, I don't imagine it was any the less resource intensive for that. No, no, this, um, it seems very, very resource intensive. Yes. <laughs> okay. The foot, again, we can deal with it from the point of view of the street. Yeah. And from the point of view of the street, I would say this is a, a, one of the most famous Gaudi facades. Yeah. It has to me like three levels going up. Yeah. At the ground, there is a kind of relatively open kind of retail level um, uh, with, a, with a kind of connected level which creeps up the next two stories. Yeah. Um, which is remarkably biomorphic. Yeah. In, uh, is it stone? Yeah, it's, it's kind of tree trunky, isn't it? Like twisted kind of 
uh, tree trunky, but also perhaps like over like articulated knees or joints yeah. going into these kind of oval. There's an oval form divided into two down the center yeah. by a kind of by some skeleton, which forms these window openings, which yeah. uh, it's definitely biomorphic. It's definitely yeah. biologically inspired, carved in stone. Yeah. Um. But exactly what bit of biology is that? Is it a plant? Is it muscular? Is this some piece of stretch, sinew or connective tissue? Hard to say. Yeah. Very striking. Also, the fact that this is being made into a completely free, continuous um, surface, I think is something to note on. Although, uh, points, things that are essentially decorative, I would say, kind, yeah. of, um, kind of columns which are almost like window mullions, do have articulation within them. They feel like they're like a different kind of biological structure kind of budding on, yeah, like yeah. a flower coming off a, a stem or something. Yeah, I mean, um, the, the, the first floor feels very bony. The, mm. they, they, they have these kind of nobbles. And yeah, I think the kind of the, the metaphor of like bones feels kind of appropriate for that. Yeah, but the other bits are like the bit like below melting is glacier or yeah. bur, or, or like um, yeah. wind sculpted stone. Yeah, yeah. So the, that's the kind. There's the kind of piano nobile with this like, which is actually like an almost completely glazed facade behind that. Yeah, sort of bony. But there's a lot of obstruction. Yeah, that kind of bony front, and then above that, it is completely covered in glass it's this like incredible it's this sort of rainbow colored facade with protruding balconies uh so it's it's got a grid of windows which have got these incredible balconies which are also very biomorphic yeah um which have got kind of two kind of oval grates that feel like they're kind of well, they're like baleen yeah. meshes yeah of raw to iron and then there's a flat facade behind it which has um it's patches kind of um almost percantilist at this distance colored glass patches which kind yeah. of blur into each other yeah. in shades of green yeah blue red light blue um and there are discs scattered across that which are ceramic painted glazed discs yeah which kind of give the surface a sort of bobbly swimming quality i've only seen it with the light not on it mm um in a, in a bright setting and in that setting i found it very much more convincing than it appears in the photograph that we're seeing yeah, now where it looks where... super yeah contrasty my experience of it much more is like the sort of wishy-washy background of a of a like impressionist painting of a garden yeah, where yeah. actually the bluey background becomes a kind of gray yeah with notes of different saturation swimming in it yeah and i think if we were going to um talk about impressionism in architecture you know the, the image yeah. of thing through the mist um all the photos are in the sun they, um, get, they get up early in the morning the photographers <laughs> <laughs> um, i mean well, it may before be that, midday anyway. well also I, I tend to like travel more <laughs> yeah. at, uh like in like january february than the rest of the year which means you just get a lot of low light and, and, then, and then we're not done then there's, there's more yeah, but I, I, like and that that i think is for me, it works really well. Yeah, amazing. But it doesn't look I guess it stands comparison pictures. again. Since we're, we're talking about Wagner all the time, you can think of like a complete correspondence with his like all glazed facade the in house. the Majolica house. Yeah. But yeah, but um, very I different. I prefer the facade wise. Yeah. I prefer this one. Well, yeah. Because those are like slightly kitschy kind of Art Deco flowers. Yeah. Whereas this is like impressionist rusiness. It's sort of. This feels Preferably. that bit feels more substantial, and then yeah. the roof is bonkers. Like, yeah. uh, uh, I uh, kind of like it, it's, but it, it is like this is pushing the envelope of its last kitsch. place in the uh, gingerbread house competition, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's like melted. <laughs> it's it is it is not utterly unreminiscent of um a gnome wendy house yeah it's got a little tower which is not utterly unreminiscent of a piece of molten icing yeah uh it's got a thing which looks like it's made of like it's got the kind of um cornice uh more elaborate multi-colored rainbow um cake piping yeah of these sort of turtle 
yeah. big glazed things going into each other. The tiles of the roof are like scales, but again, rainbow coloured. Although not quite as rainbow coloured as they appear in that picture, yeah. if my memory serves correctly. Yeah. I think all of these have like had the saturation slightly popped, yeah. which does not do them any favours. Yeah. I think it's great. It's it's very no me. It, <laughs> it it would not be us like I think it's I like it. I think it is proper art. Yeah. But it's not out of place in a pantomime. Yeah. Um architects don't really do this kind of thing very much nowadays, but uh it's but... like there is a problem <laughs> of taste, isn't there? Yeah. There's yeah. a problem of taste on this the front facade of this roof. Yeah. Yeah. If you could have done any one of these things on its own, I think it would be lovely. I think all of them together it feels like a bit a bit too much. I'm still in favour. I just <laughs> the, the problem is I've got I've got an id which kind of is in favour and a super ego in favour, but the main voice in my head is telling me this is very bad. Um, so yeah, yeah, this lumpy bumpy uh like dragon car cartoon dragon thing. Yeah. So there is at one level there is a kind of like uh sculptural sort of allegory metaphor thing going on across the whole of the of the front exterior of this building which is a sort of dragon sitting on a pile of bones which is a, a kind of heraldic symbol of uh catalonia their patron saint is saint george but but although they call him something different but, gaudi's yeah. already done some goes at dragons and things and they have never been quite like this one no this dragon is you know ready to party so at the bottom we have had um biomorphic things before oh my god is that part of casa yeah. calvet that's yeah. in the, that's in that's the landscaping which we haven't yeah. talked about that's the landscaping of casa calvet so if we skip back to the previous valley we're talking about there is landscaping yeah uh up the rear terrace or the first floor when you're not looking at the cool modern building which is very kind of the tempest isn't it that's very yeah, yeah. it's got a little uh, there's like i would say there's a bit of like overblown uh fanciful painting of like a boat. Yeah. There's like maybe twenty percent Geiger as yeah. in aliens. Yeah. But Actually crank that up to like fifty fifty percent that, fifty percent like... And there are also there's also the, the use of what I these are I suppose are these like um as found sort of wind blown rock forms yeah. rock formations. We have previously had this like bioform Thing yeah. that we will show in Calvet. Yeah. Pictures of. In the garden. But I think here it's moved even another step. Yeah. To, um, uh, from the language of like the overtly biologically inspired to the abstract. Mm -hmm. I think we can only, I think you have to see that as like a general cultural move towards abstraction. Yeah. When we talk about modernism we're normally talking about the machine aesthetic you know yeah. we're thinking in terms of local Corbusier and ocean liners and um, yeah. the self-building dam and things yeah but in the late 19th century there is obviously a artistic strain towards abstraction in general yeah um which is kind of progressive right um things it, ab abstraction in art becomes progressively more acceptable or uh progressively more established in the avant-garde yeah and i think this feels like an art an architecture that is moving towards that sort of abstraction it is not at all an abstraction of minimalism no it is a maximalist abstraction and there are still references we still got a kind yeah. of um tower with a guardian cross on it some of the forms are somewhat from nature although but kind of reimagined in a fever dream yeah. and then some are geometric origin or ab abstract but i i feel that you've got to put it into that context or yeah um the other form of abstraction yeah abstraction which is like rich and complicated rather than abstraction yeah. which Expressive. is uh, yeah. minimalist yeah 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 we couldn't call this really expressionist architecture that's a that's a kind of n that's a known movement it's yeah. a real thing i think it would be unsatisfactory to call it impressionist architecture although yeah. some elements of it feel impressionistic other bits do yeah. not but it is definitely something which feels to me like gaudi is trying to do something with this broader cultural movement yeah the chimneys are now we're now we're now we're onto the roof we're onto the roof and, and as you can imagine the roof is good there's there the chimneys are these like uh fingers uh with little pointy hats on the top and kind of bosses with kind of flower motifs 
and they are coloured in uh, broken glass again, but with it's like camouflage pattern, isn't it? It's like um, forest camouflage. At the uh, base, yeah, yeah, but then the tops with the roundels become very... Um, they become a bit more shiny. Uh, you know, yes, smashed kaleidoscopes yeah. um, with little red bobbles on top. Um, they're cool. They're cool. Not much more to say about them. They're um, nice. I mean... <sighs> Is there much more to say about them? I mean, I almost feel like that we should, but they're so inscrutable. Something to say is you do not experience them at all from the facade. The facade is the story we told about it. But then you go yeah. up on the roof and you've got a roof playground, yeah. which is yeah. like a garden. Yeah, like a, wall, a walled garden. The facade like pokes right up so that the roof is this little sheltered bowl. As, as in Vicenne's right at the beginning, yeah. the landscape of nature has become entirely man-made. Things that would be rocks and trees and plants have become strange chimney things. Yeah. And it's a sort of path of over the sloping roof and um, the rocks are becoming, you know, the top of this roof line. Camouflage passion. Yeah. Pattern, but it feels like an extreme abstraction of a sort of garden landscape. Yeah, would be an interpretation of what's going on there. These are pretty complex. How do you think you communicate how to build these? If you're the masons, I think you drew them. You just draw them. You draw and then them. You go on site a lot. <laughs> I personally reckon he draw, drew them orthogonally, and. Uh, from a like 60 30 perspective because mm. that seems to be how he does things in general in other cases he would have modeled it i mean i imagine he had to model it to design it feels like this would be a hard thing to design except through you know manipulation yeah, you could do... of kind of form plastic form oh well that's a little speculation don't but... know i don't know i don't think it's so impossible though because he has spent loads of time designing other strange things really things i also feel that the color work on the surface which here feels much much more mature yeah and sophisticated you'd have to draw that um i feel is both drawn but probably worked up with someone who was going to do it mm. like there was a painter who was just spending his whole time making those discs mm. the, of, of which there are i think literally hundreds we finally got a picture where the sun's gone down or it's in the clouds and it does look lovely actually it's, it's much much, much more sheeny much it's more, much better yeah, yeah. <laughs> it doesn't work in the oh, light lovely really. lovely okay well what got can we say we've got, we've got looking at a plan in the section the street is at the top in this plan um yeah, well that's a very famous room at the front this is much more of a sort of recognizably like our nouveau sort of plan where you've got walls going in all different directions um the only part which is really orthogonal is the sort of stairwell light well is more or less rectilinear, which I think might reflect a little bit of sort of retained structure, perhaps, from the... Yeah, I mean, it feels to me like the structure of this building is you've got strong front and yeah. rear facades with yeah. a strong second facade, a strong second wall running yeah. in parallel to the front facade. And then you've got in the, the main block three bays which may be retained with yeah. the light well and circulation around the centre. And yeah. then all the rest of it you could probably knock out, which presumably he did. Yeah. So starting at the bottom, uh, there's a famous bit with this sort of funny alcove and... Um, well, it's very much an Inglenook, actually, yes, isn't this it? Yes, is, this, is, this is straight out of the English house. This except, is a textbook Inglenook, yeah. Uh, um, except it's mushrooms within mushrooms now. We yeah. are definitely in the land of the fungus. Yeah, it's like a sort of mushroom-shaped opening with like little, um, with a sort of stove in the back and a little ingle, ingle nook seaty thing. Yeah, I mean, I guess there were like quite a lot of Anglophiles among the um, in this sort of milieu, milieu, weren't there? Yeah. yeah. I guess it's like everything. It's a rare really. moment when we uh, had some sort we're of cultural. Cool. Yeah, um, we were cool. <laughs> I mean, this is a general thing, I suppose, with Nouveau, but the. The wall and ceiling is a continuous undulating surface. Yeah. There's um the stairwell very much continues this like dragon dragonous motif. There's a sort of wooden it's wooden uh stack. Oh, yeah, it's spine. got those like big like carved wooden plates that feel like um yeah. big scales or something. Yeah. yeah, or like a spine, isn't it? I yeah, I kind of read it as like a spine. Yeah, yeah cool. Spoil. But 
they they're good like really big pieces of wood yeah um that have been that yeah. all individually like very much hand cut there's a real gradual change of the colors of the walls yeah as it goes around yeah the light walls feel less spectacular there are a few in this building there are a few showpiece sort of entertainment spaces to do with receiving and entertaining which are real showstoppers the, a lot of the rest of it is a lot more normal ish yeah uh but very light uh, and and kind of like nicely put together and, yeah. and um, stylish, but perhaps that's exceptional. But yeah, Lucas now got the image up of this. Um, this is the this is the kind of um, the front room looking out of the front of the house, where you've got that outer layer of kind of bony columns, and then you've got this inner layer of what I imagine is like retained structure, but which has been re encased. I don't know. How do you even sort of describe this? It's it's a bit like if you. Um, Put a sort of finger in the middle of a napkin and twist it. If you were in the inside of a meringue, yeah. looking up at the top of the meringue, there's a, there's little, a big chandelier. It was a small, yeah. <laughs> That's the ceiling. Um, so it's sort of Hobbit Gothic stained glass bioform curtain window, kind of bubbly honeycomb joinery around yeah. the openings. Not many straight lines. No. And then the ceiling is this big swirl. It, it, if yeah. I remember, it's like painted, got a painted pattern all over it as well. Yeah. But but like painted in like cream and off cream. Yeah, I mean, to me, it, it feels like a meringue or chocolate yeah. thing that's been kind of twisted, twisted to a point. Um, coming from, you know, yeah. any anywhere that something might come from, like the top of a column becomes this sort of sinewing flute or the edge of a door. Yeah. Um, and then that goes to a big chandelier in the middle. Yeah. You can't really build something like this unless... You've got some spare time on your hands. You've got some spare time. You can do lots of design. Lads. You've got some very good... People who are very good at making things. Yeah. I mean, they can kind of do anything. Like, it's just wall-to-wall -wall, uh, extraordinary craftsmanship, really, this um, this whole space. You could throw a stone and you would 100% hit something that was very hard to do. 100% <laughs> hit something that would be very hard to fix. With, yeah. Uh, yeah. 100%. Um, yeah. And again, like there is this sort of like sort of suppressed little bit of uh, direction towards modern architecture, isn't there? This um, this kind of completely glazed. It's like a curtain wall. I mean, it's the strangest curtain wall you've ever seen um, behind the bony columns on the um, on the first floor facade. But it is like a complete uh, non-structural well, glazed. There have been for a while different. Like I guess the first like complete glass walls come in in what the eighteen seventies or something goes. Mm office buildings in Liverpool and yeah. I guess they were doing similar things in America and it feels like it's the availability of large pieces of glass yeah uh, at still expensive but possible prices and people do them in very radically different ways you can do it gothic yeah. you can do it kind of taking a cue from industrial architecture and sort of transposing that into luxury yeah um, you can do this which is if it's a genre it's the nouveau yeah but it's a a very particular distinctive take on it you can do it in gothic as well i think there are gothic ones the style wall hasn't come down on how we're going to do these which would be utilitarian in the end yeah. real or imagined utilitarianism would yeah. be the one that would win yeah 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 rhetorical utilitarianism yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's so much of this to talk about. There's the it has, as you'd imagine, a beautiful roof space with this kind of vaulting that we've already talked about in this the one actually of was my favourite of the roof spaces. So it's rendered and it's kind of round. The surfaces are rounded. They feel a little bit like, um, you know, a plastic Zaha Hadid yeah. chair or something. And all the arches are sort of slightly different. It feels a bit like they just made them. Like if you bent a whole load, like if yeah. you try, if you got wire and tried to bend a whole load of different bits of wire to make these curves to go between to span these different things but you did it by hand yeah. so they're all a bit different and it's this continuous surface i think it's quite special yeah it looks lovely yes oh and then we just had a couple of pieces of furniture this so i this one um stayed in the family for a long time there's a certain amount of like original furniture still around he designed a lot of that as well i mean how do you what can you this piece mean? so this is a prayer and I thought, Desk. And, and when I was looking, when we were discussing uh, doing Gaudi, I thought this is the perfect example of why Gaudi is not. On the internet, a lot of people have said Gaudi is cool. Oh, really? I, they disagree with us. Oh, okay. But I would say this is an example of why Gaudi is, um, to some people at least, uncool. Yeah. <laughs> which is that he makes things like this, which are amazing objects. But what it is, is an extreme piece of total design 
ultra luxury Christian bauble. Yeah. So it's a prayer desk, which is a sort of kneeler with built in little table for putting something on. And I don't really know how to describe it. The top of it is like a kind of a stained glass sort of cloche or it looks a little Tall ampule. It's... Yes, it's an ampule, isn't it? Yeah. It's like um as if you had got a long a sort of long bead of glass, blown it. It's got a little kind of tattle on it. Except when you get in close, it's incredibly finely fitted together mm -hmm. stained glass. With little it's got like little gold roses uh erupting out of it as well and then the lower bit is uh some kind of like rosewood or veneer which feels like it's made out of like sort of ropes that have been turned into yeah wood. i want to be on the alien spaceship that this is very clearly part of uh, it's very geiger it is this is actually isn't it it's kind of geiger but like um but with upholstery added like if hr geiger had I to mean, design geiger would something be for absolutely your, for horrified your granny. by the comparison <laughs> yeah if geiger, if geiger was in, uh, into doing incredibly luxurious retirement homes yeah extreme demonstrative consumption yeah religion i think i was brought up with the wrong sort of religion for yeah this. Yeah. Um, this would be like seen as an abomination. This is yeah. like a contradiction in terms. They haven't read it's very all of the a yeah. applicable uh, texts, Yes, which I guess <laughs> was not the point. I have no doubt these people were um, uh, serious and sincere um, Christians. What can you say? It's very unlike anything else I've really How much do you think it would cost to about? have... I think if you were selling those now, the ticket price would be like half a million pounds. Yeah, well, yeah, it's very specialised. It's very specialised. Like, they would make, like, 12. So there's a sort of question with, before we finish talking about, about this one. How much does the metaphor matter? Or how important to the appreciation of the, of the architecture is the kind of, the, the narrative that's being represented in it? Um, or, on the contrary, is it kind of better if you don't really think about that? I can't necessarily say what's best. But I could say how I read it, which is that I don't really read the metaphor at all at that level, at the level of like a, a level of a big thing. Yeah. Um, I kind of um, see it as a succession of things which are to do with, they are metaphors in the sense that they are like transpositions of something that is a, a shape or weight or light or color that you're familiar with from something else. Yeah. Um, the way I read this building now, in terms of the bits that I find most interesting, which is not necessarily the only things that are good at all, is that it is this story of like um, a, a kind of a very abstracted transposition of images from other things. Yeah. So yeah, it's like a fairy tale. Yeah. A fairy tale castle, or it's like some strange biological thing. Um, the light is and color is impressionist. There's impressionist kind of color painting sort of thinking. Yeah. And I'm sh like, I um, haven't had an art history education, but I'm sure they were writing and talking about what they meant when they used these colors a lot and people were thinking about it. And I'm sure he read yeah. about that. And I'm sure that was something that was theoretical as well as... Because I think it's true. I think that like he is someone who is like set outside um, contemporary theory. And I don't yeah. think that... I suspect that's not correct. Yeah, I but, think that's that's but, caught, conjured out of the void caused by the destruction of his um, papers, isn't it? You know. Yeah, I yeah. imagine he was maybe, and also people want it to be like that. Like yeah. it's a very desirable thing. And the other thing is, but <sighs> the, but yeah, like some of the metaphors, like is it that these things are like something from biology? Yes, I think that is a metaphor, and I think yeah, definitely. I actually think eighty percent of the pleasure of buildings is not to be had from um a kind of wordy understanding of yeah or de trying to decode them yeah. i just i mean i, I asked, there is some i asked the question because i feel like the the when you visit gaudi buildings you kind of encounter a like gaudi interpretation industry which feels like it's extremely invested in you understanding these metaphorical meanings of his buildings extremely literally and like placing, uh, so I mean, to, you know, in Casa Mila, which is the building we're going to talk about in a minute, the fact that you should understand the inner courtyard as a forest is like 
hammered through home with like an extreme lack of subtlety in the uh in the the kind of audio guide and the sort of presentation materials um i think it I is because uh, i never yeah. get any of that stuff yeah. i hate reading it's and... compulsory audio guide yeah it wasn't when i was there oh, well maybe not uh, maybe, maybe you just, just didn't listen to it yeah to it. like if someone gives me a compulsory audio audio guide that is an absolute guarantee yeah. that i will not listen to yeah. it at one point i was when we were doing the research for this i was looking through the like trip advisor ratings for various things and and like um uh, <laughs> an audio guide which talks to you like you're an extremely backward child is is like a a common feature that people complain about in a lot of these. I do think that there's maybe like a slight, um, a slight, a slight I've issue never listened, with you. I, in fact, I'm going to say I've never listened to an audio guide in my entire life. I oh, haven't okay. been given them a few times. Yeah. Well, I have. I have never listened beyond like one thing. Maybe. Yeah. There you go. Okay. This is the super. Fa this is the one of the like top three super super famous ones. Casamila was uh a, is an apartment building also on Pasha de gracia built by gaudi between 1906 and 1912. the story behind the commission is it was commissioned by a guy called pere mila who was a, a property developer and he had got together with a woman called rosaire segemon who was a wealthy widow her previous husband was a guy called Josep Guardiola who as you can imagine was uh, another Indiano um, he'd had a coffee plantations in Guatemala he'd made lots and lots of money he'd come back to um, Barcelona got married got deceased um, and so lucky Per Mila was in the position to spend all of this money from the first and husband there's a man who's very good at helping you spend prodigious amounts of money it's a property developer it's Anton Gaudi. Is that oh yeah? <laughs> yeah like, oh yeah. Well yeah. Yes. Yes. Let me help you with that. Yeah. And there's a lot of toing and froing with the city council all the way through uh, the design and construction of this building because the ground story pokes out into the street, which is not allowed to do. The upper stories also kind of uh, push out further. They like lean out further over the street. Also, is much too tall and doesn't respect the height limits in the city plan. And so there's all kinds of... And it had a massive religious sculpture on top. It did originally have a massive religious sculpture on the top, but that was that was cut. Uh, <laughs> should we talk about it? Yes. It's a big building. It's bigger than any of the other buildings we've talked about so far. It's a corner. It's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, seven in the main bit with yeah. some trimmings on either end. Yeah. It's big. The it the first thing that strikes you is that it has this undulating stone facade with yeah. big openings. Yeah. On there's a sort of grid of not really rectangular. They're more like eroded, sculpted openings on a continuous facade that is banded. Yeah. And people talk about it as if it's like a windswept rock or a quarry. Yeah. Or yeah, the quarry, it's called the quarry is the like the uh the local kind of popular nickname for it. Uh not wholly complimentary. It's very rough, but it's also sort of undulating. It's kind of biomorphic, whereas in Casabio the like biomorphic elements are, are more separate. In this one it's like this your main impression is of um of this kind of mass, this kind of undulating mass of the of the yeah, facade i think it is it's definitely closer you know whereas the other one was a whole series of things this feels like a big round sedimentary rock yeah that's been kind of eroded in layers and has got all these pock holes in it yeah some of which have kind of a kind of lichen of of balustrade yeah. ironwork black ironwork all twists and turns yeah. the facade goes up not completely vertically, but vertically-ish. Yeah. And then kind of rounds off to this kind of cakey top. Yeah. And then there's a whole load of other things. Yeah. There's a sort of semi giant story at the bottom, or like like more permeable level. Yeah. There's a roof, which is um, not stone, I think, or is it? No, it's uh, ceramic. I think yeah, it is, ceramic, yeah. but kind of looks stone-y, with yeah. lots and lots of little windows in it. And then above that, there are these famous large... Well, then all chimneys. 
Yeah, that's big of, cakey things on the top. Chimney ventilation, swirls, um, um, tops of tops of um, stairwells. Yeah, on each story, more or less where you imagine the floor li floor line would be, the kind of bottom of the floor plate, maybe it has like a sharp line. Yeah, where it kind of come, but um, but which is still a sort of undulating sharp line. Yeah, it's like. Uh, yeah, it's kind of like a like a like a fold. Kind of, if you were kind of plastering with a palette knife, yeah, this curving surface, and you brought it up to an aris, yeah, but it, like just following the curves of this sinuous object, and that kind of undulates both in and out and up and down, and then a lot of the openings, the openings are all kind of popping up and down a little bit, and some of them are like completely rounded, others are are more sort of square, and then on each story, it like goes in and comes out again. So that so the um the facade is kind of undulating out at the at the more or less the kind of floor line of each story where this where this sort of sharp line is and then kind of going back back in again. And it feels yeah, it feels kind of hollowed out. It feels like a like a coral or like um yeah, like a kind of wind eroded rock. Where if you, have... you were gonna prepare drawings to construct the stonework, working drawings, they would be amazingly difficult to draw. I mean much more so than I sort of think I would kind of know how you could do the chimneys. Because it's because it's a material you don't have to carve. These or this is made of lots of pieces of stone which presumably fit together over a metal or, or it's steel, isn't it? Not concrete. Uh, yeah, so internally it's a steel uh steel columns that hold up the building. Um and so the yeah, the the facade is um yeah. self supporting rather than uh yeah. structural. F fitting together over some sort of armature. I, yeah. uh, if I was going to recreate this in stone, which it wouldn't be how I'd do it, I'd probably put the whole thing together and then carve it to shape on site with a kanga hammer. That's not how they did it. So that yeah, the limestone is from Garaf. Uh is the identity of this particular limestone, for what that's worth. In one of Mark Burry's lectures, I think he says that the way that they did the stones on this facade is that they made a plaster one-to-one -one and then they took it up on the scaffold and checked it and then brought it back down again or something like that and then or maybe they also took the stones up and then took them back down again there's some like incredibly labor intensive process that went on in the in the production of this facade that um, so they offered but, every single piece of stone up well i think you kind of had to because there wasn't any turned out there wasn't any other real way to do it we've got this um construction photo which is sort of a little bit hard yeah. to know what to make of exactly it looks very ruinous it's got a big flag on the roof Nowadays, there's these these trees growing quite close to it, and they, yeah, it's um, very much feels like you're sort of up against a cliff face or something with these with these sort of trees growing below. The um, it does feel this facade does feel very powerful and impressive. You would not do this in stone now. No, I feel pretty certain. Like even then, it's not something you generally see because it just seems so hard. Yeah, <laughs> to do. Yeah, <laughs> seems so very hard to do to have this thing, which is really just a facade effect. Yeah, um, albeit one that makes the facade feel really. Yeah, like like it's just like the whole building is just carved out of a solid block of something, which is a, an impressive thing. Like on the scale of budget blowing <laughs> ways of doing a facade, this is really up there. Yeah, it's interesting. So there are also these moments in the stone where it's almost like a little bit of historicism sort of emerges to the surface, like, a, you know, like a kind of, um, I don't know how to characterize it, you know, like a kind of pattern in the clouds or something, you know, like there are these little moments where there's a, a, mm. a, a kind of a little sort of sculptural wiggle that appears or um, up at the top of the facade there is... Um, you know, occasionally there are these kind of quasi capitals which appear yeah. as a little undulating line, or um, up at the top of the facade, that the the very top of it has the this kind of very 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 low relief kind of drawn on suggestion of a kind of scroll work that's right at the yeah at the top. It's um, it's fun. I mean, that's a sort of yeah. fun thing because yeah, like when you first look at it, it's definitely the massing of a rock. Yeah, but this is a very different way to do. It's like. Like the program for Petra has been put into this yeah. thing, but it's just been executed a tiny bit. But it is also a time when abstracting classicism yeah. is popular. Yeah. Um, Los abstracts classicism, yeah. but also like Lutchins or yeah. 
but they do it in a very different way, yeah. <laughs> which is quite cold, hard, linear. The abstracting it into something which is essentially bioform yeah. is not common, partly because it, I presume, is very difficult. Yeah. In this building, he has a real joy of um, a pattern emerging, like, from a, 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 a surface. Yeah. So, like, um, you know, like, the dust is kind of blown into these, like, swirling patterns, and that becomes yeah. Yeah. the ceiling or the, the wall. Something kind of bubbles, um, bubbles to the surface. It's just not easy to do when you have... Because you, with, with, with stone, where you're removing a surface, if you want to have these things... You kind of have to like leave them and cut them in, and the whole thing yeah. just seems very difficult. Then you have these balconies, which are by his assistant Jujol, which are um, kind of like massive bits of seaweed, or they're kind of yeah, massive I was seaweed. Of lichens or mosses growing yeah. on this, on the crevices of this surface, on like a massive scale, which were apparently drawn one to one. This is the the way in which they were worked out. Cool. Which yeah. Is, you know, well, I mean, you would presumably have to at some point. Yeah. So when you were doing that. But which, yeah, they're very kind of three-dimensional, but they're also very... Um, the way that they're sort of overlaid onto the onto the facades is um, also... Yeah, like they're kind of creeping across them. It's, it's really... It's very organic. Someone who, like, saw this and thought they were ever going to make money out of this as a speculative develop development, should, you would think, would not be an experienced property developer. Yeah. Well, I think he wanted to do something extremely cool and to ha be the talk of the town. And uh, uh, I mean, this is extremely cool. It was extremely cool. It is extremely cool. He was, I mean, it it was the talk of the town. Unfortunately, he died, um, and his widow um, was, was, the, was the one left, left completing it. And yeah. uh, uh, no, I mean, no. I think um, yeah, but she put her foot down about a few things. There, there was meant to be, the, as you say, like an enormous um, uh, sculptural thing of the Virgin Mary. Uh, or also with like some kind of big roses which were about her name which she decided that they weren't going to have um, I wonder what on earth it could have possibly been like it would <laughs> seem to be very strange to put to me looking at the building in its finished state I yeah. perhaps lack the imagination to imagine how it could be improved by having an enormous statue yeah. of the Virgin Mary covered in roses on the top of it but um, no yeah. doubt that's because I'm not um, as insightful as Gaudi in these matters yeah, it's so some of the, the the drawings which exist of this still are like a lot of them are the ones submitted to the city council, I think, and they are extremely which he was lying extremely or... minimal. Okay, should we talk about what else is going on? Yeah, so it is um, uh, planned out in a, I mean, it's a bigger building than he's had to do before, and it has a more complex plan and yeah. a more complex section. Yeah, in some ways, it's got two big light wells and two little light wells. They are also kind of. Yeah, sort of biomorphic, Art Nouveau-y. There's a sort of ellipsoid one. There's a kind of spheroid one. So the the, the structure is, um, it's a frame. It's got steel columns all over the place. And he's sort of making the most of the potential of um, of steel columns. Right. That, you can... that also looks difficult, though, to me, because every... This is um, not the steel frame of a Chicago office block. No. It is the steel frame of something that's reaching towards a Zaha Hadid building where yeah. each piece of steel is different. <laughs> well, yeah, they're just all over the place, aren't they? I think they're just round <laughs> columns, but they're just in, in well, all sorts I, of places. Well, I'm thinking of the... How are the floor plates done? Yeah, I don't know. Because every span is different. And like, yeah. and it's spanning towards... You know, it's like... um, To the first approximation, the uh, plan is kind of like a section through a load of bubbles, you know, yeah. where like sometimes the lines come together and they have a, there's kind of equal pressure on both sides and yeah. it's um, straight lines, but it's kind of like foam. Yeah. Um, or, the, you know, cross section through the cells of a leaf or something. Yeah. Um, they're mostly these quite little spans and I imagine they're vaulted. I haven't, I haven't, uh... oh, I assume the whole thing was steel. Uh, yeah, maybe. There's certainly um, a big drum down uh, on the um, basement level, yeah. which um, I think covers the top of um, one of those light wells, which is yeah. one huge steel. Uh, that's this one. Yes. Yes. So what? how do you think the floor deck is, is made? It's. I was assuming it was posts and beams. But then how do you span what's spanning between the beams? Yeah, I mean, you could have like little beams and then you should have like um, Catalan vaulting between yeah. them or something. I mean, yeah. I, I really don't know. But at that, at that point, that would be kind of like one of those like um, 
ones that you made out of my uh, posts and beams with you know precast concrete elements or whatever yeah um or like or like one of the ones where you leave the form work in you know yeah which, which spans between small i imagine um, i imagine it's some catalan vaulting in between the in between like close yeah. but you could do it at like i don't know they're probably 600 quite... centers or something yeah okay right uh, so, um, stand down if you've already got very angry about us being <laughs> wrong earlier in the program. Um, the So the answer is, the floors are steel, and the structure is a mixture of stone, brick, and iron columns, variously. That would make sense. Yeah. Cast iron columns. Yeah. That's, that's how you would have done it earlier than this period. Yeah. So there's a kind of... It, yeah, so on the, it, on the inside of the... Um, well, I guess on the inside of this light well, you can see these lower levels are stone columns. And then at a certain point, they must switch to being iron, I think, where they they become much finer and get encased in the wall. I, so, I mean, cast iron columns are amazing. They can be yeah. so thin and yeah. take so much load. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's mill. Like, um, cast iron column, wrought iron beam vaulting between is mill construction. Yeah, basically. Yeah, well, and you can see that um, you can see the the vaulting construction is like yeah. this all shallow. Yeah, so they really are there. Yeah. Like, they're, yeah. like that could even be vaulted by like you could if you wanted to vault it with a single tile. Yeah, which you sometimes get. Yeah, and then you like pour whatever's passing the concrete at that particular point in history. Yeah, on top. Yeah, so there's some light wells. The light wells, um, inter on the interior of the light wells, they. They're a kind of a bit like the facade of the Casa Bayo. They're again this kind of um, sort of cloudy, um, color washy. Here it's painted. Am I right? Yeah, this painted. It's paint. Is it polished plaster or something like that? It's some kind of like painted sealed yeah. plaster, which then kind of wraps down onto the soffits. I was looking at the painting. It's like it's kind of it's a there's a fairly light ground to it, and then it's got this kind of wispy, smoky like a smoke pattern. Again, it feels Im like an impressionist use of colour, which also kind of goes in gradients up as it as the light changes up in the light well. Is it a forest? Sort of. Not really. Yeah, I didn't hear this metaphor at all. I mean, yeah. the the metaphor of a forest of columns is is true of a set of basically any building with columns in it. I guess this one is more foresty because the columns are not on a grid. They're kind of yeah irregular. Yeah, there is a there is a kind of painted scheme which has. I remember like, like loads of flowers and things. Yeah, flowers like... and like nature motifs and things. In some ways, I think that um, we've talked about too many roofs already. But this has another one. This is a really great. Um, it's a roof on a grand scale, the attic, um, which was originally completely empty, and it's a kind of two story. It's funny, he's done it again. He's done this incredibly like elaborate, difficult, expensive way of doing this thing. Yeah. For nothing inside, yeah. <laughs> just to create that roof line. Again, which I feel you must have been able to do somehow. That, you could have like, yeah, like <laughs> smashed together some timbers, and they're like, I mean, I, don't know, I didn't have plywood back then, but they're the, they're the um, yeah. If this... you wanted to do a cheap way of this, it'd be like, oh, do a timber frame and then like staple loads of like five mil ply to it. Yeah, well, in for a penny, in for a pound, isn't it? So yeah, they're, again, they're these these kind of like Catalan vaulted ribs. In this case, going all the way around uh, this kind of sort of semi figure eight pattern around the around the various light wells, and then on top again, you've got this sort of roof landscape with its um, ice cream cones and twisting columns, and I don't even know like kind of sea jellies, you know, sea kind of sea cucumber like forms. I got some pics. Yeah. How do you? I mean, how do you, this one it, it is a sort of? Well, it of looks like a big kind of dress yeah. bustling out all around sort and of 1950s lampshade a cone, or, yeah. and then it wiggles in and out with a sort of way. bottle yeah this roof i think is the most like handsome and um here it doesn't have the bright colors and the forms are large as well yeah they're large and they so they rely entirely for their effect on on, on these kind of formal effects these sort of sculptural effects there's all kinds of I mean, this stuff is quite hard to design, isn't it? Like how this this one that we're looking at on the far left there, which is uh, like a like a whole series of sort of eyes mm. punch. The man Gaudi, he enjoyed complicated geometry. Yeah. So what's the deal with these? This is these are like 
they're sort of like a lot of very shallow cones that have been kind of which are kind of concave they're all sort of tessellated next to each other and then they make these strange irregular like shapes where they butt up against each other and then there are these sort of eye-shaped apertures poked through in his work he does like move towards a way of working in the a kind of form finding with wet plaster and this to, this to me definitely looks like it's in that kind of world where um there are sort of forms these sort of forms and these kind of overlapping edges which are which which like in the way i imagine it are, are created by like having some kind of a wet plaster kind of object and sort of sculpting first one way and then another so that you kind of get yeah. a sharp edge between them the trouble is i then start thinking about how you do it and each time i'm not totally confident if i could hold it in my hands and play around with it for you know yeah. an hour I'm, I'm sure i'd be able to figure out how you could geometrically construct that they yeah. do feel like processes where you are removing material from yeah. you could or like at least my method of starting would be you'd start with something and you'd have something which is like a process which is removing material systematically yeah uh and you would end up with something like that that's how it feels to me so these big ones are very much like they're very much with mr whippy aren't they they're kind of um they're they're they're, they're sort of exploring a bit of the same language as the uh, ceiling of the Casa Bayo, but kind of the other way up and much, much um, higher. My feeling is that actually these, uh, most of these are not so precisely geometrically defined as, um, having looked at them a little bit now, um, a couple of them might be defined by a, like a mathematical principle, but I think a lot of these are kind of like sculpted, I guess you could do a maquette and then mm. do a small thing and yeah. Um, but yes, it is definitely something that's made of something with a kind of liquidy property. Yeah. And then they end up covered in this um, uh, broken tile, but again in white. It's definitely my favourite of the roofs, this one. It's okay. it's by far the grandest. Yeah. It's picturesque. Yeah. This one doesn't, have the, doesn't feel so, so much like a metaphor of a garden as like these are kind of rocks coming up in a in a kind of undulating plane. Yeah, and it has the, it's a sort of landscape as well because it's got you kind of circling around each of these four light wells, too big, too small. Yeah. With, and each of them, each, yeah. And you've got like different scales. You've got the kind of tops of the, the staircases, which are these big uh, meringues with kind of craggy crystalline tops. And then there's uh, a few ventilation shafts, which were like the, the kind of seed yeah. pod thing we were talking about earlier. And the guardian like chimney tops, like kind of helmets. You kind of are always left with uh, a succession of wherever you look, kind of middle grounds yeah. going off. Yeah. Um, and also because obviously you're on a roof, there are things in the distance. Yeah. You don't see a lot in this image, but you are aware of distant hills you're and very surrounded city. by the city yeah and that's it means that you have this kind of exciting play of strange and visually interesting things i like uh the other roofs the the top is not flat yeah the bit you're walking on has got uh, uh, slopes and steps so you get this yes interesting garden walk yeah. around objects which feels a bit like you know one of those japanese gardens where you've yeah. got like a series of kind of picturesque contrived yeah and yet asymmetric viewpoints you get a good view of it in antonioni's the passenger which i think we mentioned already we'll probably probably do a, a bonus about it yeah. um but you get like a different sense of it as a building as well because it's uh that film was shot in i think 73 and you know you get the kind of outside views of it where it's still got like a big illuminated sign like halfway up it for someone's business that was obviously being run out of the offices and that, you know, the top is kind of relatively uh, kind of unoccupied and um, you kind of had the run of the place, you know, there's a bit in the film where they go. In 73, yeah. this is still Franco Spain. Yeah, is like, it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dying days of Franco Spain. Um, sure, it's like a bit neglected, but you also get like a bit of a feeling of it as a as a sort of living building rather than a kind of enormous tourist object which it is now that um you know i think there are still like four apartments occupied but um it's almost entirely like across the whole building uh, the, yeah um it's you know the like the big bits full of various sort of gaudy foundations and exhibits and somehow uh it's both like suffocatingly full of people 
but also feels like like sort of unoccupied or it's a yeah 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 it's dead a bit sad you can go around one apartment as well so i'm not super convinced actually by the internal conditions of the apartments there's an awful lot of like borrowed light you know you've got i guess maybe these are like servants <laughs> rooms or something mm. but you've got these like inner rooms that borrow light from a corridor and then none of the rooms are that big they're all on they're all like relatively kind of modestly scaled and generally slightly weirdly shaped i think there is a floor where um where the milan and Sejimon had their own apartments laid out which i imagine were, were on a slightly larger uh grander scale Mm. Although I think she had a very ungaudy decorative scheme done to it. <laughs> yeah, well, you can do that. You know? Yeah, um, I think I think people should be allowed to do what they want on the inside of the flats. Yeah, um, the flat was that you can go around is quite large, but yeah. yeah, lots of small rooms, a lot of corridor. Like you, you find yourself skirting like fully one half of these quite large light wells. Uh, I feel like it could like comfortably accommodate two young children, a couple, and three servants. Mm, yeah sort of like that that's um, probably the vibe i think the weird plan it doesn't feel like it's really making the rooms better no it's not super making them worse but i'm not really sure they would be better if all the wall worse walls were curved it would feel more expensive yeah but you... i'm not really sure rooms that f for i'm not sure like your bedroom needs to have all the walls curved it's kind of inconvenient yeah <laughs> In terms of user, like, if you think about the the area on the plan that is available for, like, rooms inhabited by the owners, it's basically like a thin layer on the front and a thin layer on the back, which is shorter because the back is, is kind of pushed in because of this corner site. And then this whole, like, thick middle is stairs, servants' rooms, the odd, like, kitchen and these massive light wells. And it's all... Well, yeah. I think that the all these urban buildings actually, um, even the big houses. First of all, you've got like yeah. three big entertaining rooms, yeah. which are also living rooms, and you might on the next floor have bedrooms, and then the rest of it is circulation, light wells, and service space. But you see what I mean? Part. There's like and the exception is like the Palaguel, which has got that massive room in the middle. Do you have this kind of? These are almost like sort of. We're, Making the kind is of is that a developer bedroom? <laughs> yeah, you know, like you've got this sort of this weird. No, uh, it's not because it's got walls that are not parallel to each other. It's got this non-parallel wall, and then you've got uh, by the window, you've got these two uh, sort of stone columns that have been mm. plastered over, giving it this odd kind of undulating appearance with the with the window punched through in the middle. It's a bit like when we were talking about Jean Renaudy and the kind of compromises made in the planning of some of those flats by uh by by uh the the, the kind of um yeah the principles of the and in plan. both cases the picturesque a, sen a sensibility towards the picturesque was the from the outside yeah yeah uh and the top and yeah uh bits of the inside but not inside the rooms yeah is was the like overriding principle yeah the room um, just about works if you have almost no furniture in it. But, you know, the decision to put this like little dressing table in here is really throwing it out of whack. Yeah, I don't think he was mega interested. So the building, there's a... there's a. I mean, also yeah. probably, by the way, like, it doesn't really benefit from being a weird show flat. No. This is like a very high profile building. And it's one where um, there's a lot of like media around it. There's a the sort of public reception of it. It's a kind of cause celebre as far as buildings go. For example, there are lots of cartoons of it. <laughs> it becomes a kind of butt of, of sort of jokes, not uh, which aren't necessarily to the detriment of the building, actually. So we're looking at, there's this, uh, is he called Gies van Herbergen? He's a biographer of Gaudi. Anyway, he has, has re 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 reproduces a bunch of these little cartoons of, um, of the building in there, which are very enjoyable and kind of characterful. We've got one where... Um, the balconies are rendered as like an enormous pile of junk under a kind of spreading tree i think yeah uh we've got one where all of the openings are occupied by like enormous like naval cannons uh and the the, the form of the building is sort of suggested to have been produced by 
the effect of shelling, I guess. Mm. Uh, we've got one where um, it's kind of surrounded by all sorts of amazing futuristic flying machines. This one is quite complimentary, rather. It does say garage on the top. but it's, I, It imagines it as a multi-storey car park for um, um, all-powered airships. Yeah. I think my favourite one is this one where they're all, they're kind of like all caves and they're full of all of these slightly goofy looking animals sort of staring out from the shadowy depths. That's yeah. a nice, quite enjoyable I mean, one. It's a building which is very ready to receive metaphors. Oh, I've just noticed that the, the kind of sculptures on the roof are rendered as piles of human skulls in the same one. Yeah. Don't know. I <laughs> don't know what that's, that's completely fair. El Diluvio, the flood. Yeah. But what's going Yeah. Is it Noah's Ark? Yeah, maybe are they, it's are those animals in pairs. They know it's Ark, yeah. But why are they? Why is it covered in skulls? That's not a part of the Noah mythos that I'm aware of. This building is good. It's very good. But it's a bit good because he was allowed to do something very expensive and difficult. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot nicer. It's still a building. Yeah. So later on in our century, people would make sort of blobby things and they yeah. wouldn't really know what to do with the inside spaces either. And they also would have like problems with the walls not being straight. But they would often just be a sculpture. Whereas this is a building. The yeah. facade is a picturesque building. It's yeah. like a cliff face or something, but it's very much still yeah. architecture. Uh, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm the, the blobby things can be architecture too, but that, you know, yeah. it's like recognizably grounded like it it can for example exist yeah. in its street next to other buildings yeah. without them it doesn't have to like like sit on top of them or demolish everything around it and sit in a hollow in the ground like it no it's not an object like a it's not an meteor. object it's a, it's a um, piece of the city um and very enjoyably so like very dramatic i mean actually like its effect at ground level which i don't think i have any good pictures of is is very enjoyable you know you've got this like this slightly sunken shops yeah uh you've got this like double double story at ground level with these um rather dramatic yeah kind of spreading columns uh as a yeah as a presence as a kind of civic or urban presence like it's extremely um it's really satisfying positive. um and it's it's sort of roughness and it's yeah this kind of mix of like the roughness and the exquisite the way that it's got this kind of like scaly this kind of barky scaly like rough hewn texture but which then comes uh to these sharp lines which are these beautiful beautifully kind of drawn curves like something from john ruskin's um page of beautiful curves you know and like... bits of the yeah and bits of the interior decoration yeah. where those very fine ceilings are yeah but there's something about that mix mixture of like roughness and yeah. like elegance i think is extremely urbane and yeah. extremely uh you know yeah yeah, but you can go in. What I mean, what I was gonna say with that is, is you go in from something rough and yeah. have an immediate connection to something rough, and yeah. there, it, there is a, at points it does have that kind of like polished inside of the shell as well. Um, yeah, although I think not able to. I, I guess that stuff would have been done later as well. Possibly might have been slightly reduced. Although I think he got as much as he reasonably could have expected to on this one. Yeah. So this is, I mean, the story of what happened was. Yeah, he really fell out with the client on this one and he fell out with the client and he also fell out with the city in the process and he kind of fell out with i mean he kind of had a sort of rude awakening as to his reputation or you know there was um there's a whole series of different things the so the client didn't want to pay because it had gone so far over budget and he took them to court which is really not the done thing at all and was awarded he was awarded some money but um it's essentially his the end of his ability to get these kind of like prestigious private commissions doesn't get another yeah. one after apart this apart from from well apart from, well even from i mean well he's still working on existing ones from from well but i'm not sure any new ones started after this and yeah that's all kind of dependent on well yeah as long as well's still alive he's you know yeah he's still eating from but like yeah he he couldn't get any new clients of that kind um after after this um and yeah, obviously he's kind of fallen out with the city. I think he probably enjoyed poking the the bureaucrats and the urban uh, planners and things. There's a there's a big prize for architecture, um, which this was en entered for and which it was passed over for. It's sort of 
like a lot of great buildings, arrives like slightly too late for its moment. So in sort of fashionable architectural circles, there had been a turn around the time that this was finished or towards um, a much more stripped back style, which is called a kind of new century style. Or no nocentisme, I think, is the is, is what it's called. Architectural fashion has left him behind and it sort of turned up its nose at, at this. And this this arrives, I don't know, like like the Barbican Centre, you know, like another building that we've talked about, much too late for its style. It's kind of completed at a time when kind of architects are all, or, you know, like Alexandra Road, to take an exa mm. another example. Like now all these things which we now think of as kind of masterpieces of, of, of brutalist architecture to take a much later kind of movement actually arrive at a point where all the cool kids think that that's incredibly boring <laughs> but we've gone really gone on to something different I think now there's a process by which gaudi when gaudi starts he's a part of the mainstream um his early projects are um exotic or, or uh, uh, fruity and luxurious examples of something that was um yeah, yeah, part of the cultural mainstream. And yeah. I feel that he is going off on his own path, which is already well established by the time of this, at the same time as the kind of zeitgeist, as popular culture, or the, or the kind of general culture is going off in a different way. But I also feel that it's not just that fashions were changing, but that also he was beginning to push things in a slightly different way the interesting most interesting properties of this building are not straightforward modernism it's it's not at all like the hospital is it no it's, it's not at all yeah it's not really like art nouveau at all actually it's very it has, it has it is delicate and detailed but it is tough yeah and um it is i suppose luxurious luxurious in a very austere way yeah uh, unlike many of his earlier projects. I mean, this kind of efflorescence of like mocking images of it, I think at least partly suggests how interesting it is yeah. and exciting it is as a visual prospect and how open for kind of different takes it is. Yeah, And I can see how the fashion would be a problem for that. But I also think it's not just fashion. Yeah, It's not just that Gaudi's going out of fashion. It's that Gaudi himself is going off into doing something quite particular um, yeah. and exciting and unique to himself. Yeah, yeah. Um, which he's is this abstract sculptural... Yeah, he's off the map, isn't he? He's he's kind of he's kind of going into uncharted territory, and I think that would have... I mean, I also think that if it, uh, prizes are weird. Yeah. They're not well judged. I would hope... Yeah, the best film doesn't actually win the Oscar. That's yeah. not, that's I not would how it works. That, like, <laughs> I, it seems very unlikely to me that there was a more interesting building finished in Barcelona in that year. Yeah, um, and I would hope that decades, if you yeah. had got, or I would hope that if you would got um, a number of really good people, and you could have, they could have come to that conclusion even then. Yeah, because I think it's very interesting. There's a funny little uh, kind of postscript to this, which is that in the 1950s, I think in 56, no, 53 to 55, um, an architect called um, Francisco Juan Barba Corsini converted the empty roof space um, at the behest of the owners to try and increase, um, you know, to get some more dwellings in and built all of these really actually rather delightful little, um, uh, sort of, I think they're duplexes sort of fitted into into the the upper story um and there's a whole series of plans of yeah it's quite kind of available like, scan the, cool or yeah. like italian design yeah i mean it's so incongruous i mean yeah. apart from the these, these kind of egg-shaped forms um you would never know they've got some yeah some like ceramic yeah. tile i would i would say that looks like a groovy interior it, they're very groovy they've got some they've got some lovely moments yeah also thinking about how you kind of get these little stairwells inside these inside these he spaces. built he built another um stair thing onto the roof as featured in this image on the front cover of this book yeah this was from the um Corsini, redevelopment yeah. and it's been subsequently demolished yeah yeah well all of this was stripped out i think it's rather a shame actually because uh if you go there now those spaces are like empty and have they've got like two models they're in empty them. badly lit have a few models and basically have no purpose and i think uh 
I mean, I, I, I would why... say having no purpose other than people going through them, though, is what's happened essentially the entire building. Yeah. It's sad. I think these are really sweet. I like this little um, lightweight steel kind of staircase with this little uh, sort of triangular treads. It's very good. Yeah, I, I mean, the it... whole thing is extremely groovy. Look at these guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Space cadets. Yeah. Um, <laughs> these are like, yeah, yeah. The... <laughs> it's a mix of the like groovy and the, the I guess this is probably about as groovy as you could get in Franco Spain in 1953 or whatever I think it, it seems ex astonishingly groovy <laughs> for it uh, yeah there's a nice mixture of the, there are like a few little reassuring signs there's something which looks almost like a hearth and there's um yeah yeah I mean that that um rug is not entirely undoily like yeah yeah well I, I encourage you we'll put some of these images up and I encourage you to 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 seek them out they are uh yeah, I think rather delightful and a bit, I think, a bit of a loss to have um, got rid of. Yeah, it's this UNESCO side. Yeah, it is. This is this is pure UNESCO side, isn't it? I think well, that could be the end, you know. I think that could be the end of that episode. I think we probably have recorded... Two and a quarter hours quarter with quarter some hours. intermissions. Okay, yes, right. Well, uh, you won't get all of that because quite a lot of it is faffing around and, and, uh, and uh, unrepeatable nonsense, but... Um, still probably quite a lot of it has ended up in the episode thank you all very much for listening we're sort of trying to crank back up into gear and chug through the rest of gaudi so it doesn't take the whole rest of our lives it's uh i think it's there's like so two far. more main episodes yeah unless they get they're yeah. quite big yeah there's probably two two maybe three yeah uh and we've got to do a bit of bonus material We'll probably do the passenger, I should think. Yeah, well, maybe another one. Maybe we'll, we'll do. The, we might do the. Yeah, might do the passenger. Yeah, and I'm sure something else will occur to us as a, as a, a little bolt on. But thanks a lot for listening and bearing with us. Yes, and uh, very much hope that you'll join us again soon. Night, night, night. Bye, bye. <laughs>